It's Ryan over at Two Minute Tennis. Super excited to go live. Gonna go live for a little bit here, maybe for 20, 25, 30 minutes. We'll see. Um, and I wanna help you with your strategy, your footwork, your technique. We're gonna do some strategy work on the big board. Let's talk really simple single strategy. So realize there are five phases of a singles point. You've got serving, returning, rallying, you're going to the net and your opponent's going to the net. So if you can get better at those, those phases and just improve a little bit in each one, hey, what's up Nintendo? You're gonna have an enormous advantage. And if you play people who you typically you know, are neck and neck with, but you get just a little bit better in each phase, it's incredible. What's up, Toby? Uh, you are gonna get a lot better. So let's talk about rallying. We're talking single strategy with the rallying phase. Don't forget to hit that like button, everyone. We got 23 people in here. What's up, Cindy? Thanks so much. We got 23 people in here and only two likes. Oh, you got the heart. That hurts my heart that there are only two likes. Make sure you hit that like button. So let's talk rallying. There is such a simple way to be more consistent when you are rallying. And all we have to know is where we tend to miss. And if you have a question, what's up, D? If you have a question, just throw it in the comments and I will be happy to answer it. I'm gonna be on here live for about 20, 25 minutes. Here's a really simple way to be more consistent when you are rallying in singles. Simply always have an air target above the net, always. Let me ask all of you, and you can feel free to answer in the comments. What percentage of the time when you are rallying, do you pick mentally, do you pick a specific height over the net that you're trying to make the ball cross? What percentage of the time? I'm not asking you how often do you hit your target. I'm simply asking how often in your mind do you have a target of exactly how high you want the ball to cross over the net? Usually, if people do have a target, and it's rarely, probably less than 10%, 25, I appreciate the honesty. That, by the way, uh, six feet over the net, you got it, Esquire. The idea is really simple. When you hit the ball higher over the net, you hit the net less. Now, I'm no rocket scientist, but I know that if you hit higher and you avoid the net, you hit the net less. In addition, when you hit the ball higher, you get the ball to land deeper. <laughs> Thanks so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We go, we go to uh, to OC every Ocean City, New Jersey every every summer. Um, so for a week. So hitting with depth is the number one way. Hitting with depth. Of course, I got this on the boardwalk. It's one of those like boardwalk sweatshirts, you know. Um, but hitting with depth is one of the no, it's actually the number one way to force an error from your opponent. So not only is hitting higher over the net when you're rallying gonna help you hit the net less and just be more consistent, it's also gonna get the ball to land deeper, which is going to force an error. So my, my challenge for all of you watching right now is start aiming to a specific height over the net every single time you hit the ball. Now I will say this, as you move forward, aim lower over the net. As you move back, aim higher over the net. What I typically see, uh, what I typically see with players as they move forward is they hit the ball a little softer to make sure it goes in. And as they move back, they hit the ball harder to try to get it to go the distance they need it to go when really you shouldn't necessarily be changing the speed of your shot. You need to be changing the height you hit over the net. 39 people in here, this is awesome. Uh, yes, it does, D. yeah. This can apply in doubles. Now, the one thing about doubles that people underestimate is, or think that you cannot do, is hitting the ball high over the net. See, in doubles, we tend to not think of hitting the ball high over the net. And it's because we have the wrong definition of a lob. 
See, a lob is not a ball that goes over someone's head. We think like, oh, a lob is a ball that goes over someone's head. No, it's not. That's not what a lob is. A lob is simply a high ball. So if you are, let's say you're rallying, you're the server, this is you, and you're hitting back and forth, right? You've got a really aggressive net player. What we tend to think is, oh, I need to hit the ball farther over here to keep it away from a poacher. And if this person's very aggressive, we think that the only option is to hit the ball down the line fast or to hit over them or to hit low and fast over here. When I'll tell you there's a great option that just isn't hit enough. And it's a high lob cross court. A high cross court lob over nobody's head is a great shot to hit and it completely takes this person out of the play. They will do zero poaching. So if you have a very aggressive net player in doubles and when you hit low cross court, they tend to go get it and then slam it at your net person who has not enough time to react. You can always lob cross court as long as this person is staying back. And then by the way, that's a great time to just sneak in because you just bought yourself time to get in. Now it's two against one. And now you both are in and you're both picking on the person with less time to react. I would say the shot that I see the least, like I do Zoom lessons. So every week I meet with about a dozen people for Zoom lessons. And they send me videos of them playing matches, doubles, singles, uh, their serve, their forehand, the backhand, whatever. And I teach them live on Zoom. I share my screen. I draw on the screen side-by-side -side comparison of the pros and their technique. And when I see players playing doubles, and I help a lot of doubles teams, when I see players play doubles, and it's the, the club level tennis, right? 3-0, 3-5, 4-0, 4-5. The shot that I don't see enough is a cross-court lob. Because players have the wrong... Um, they have the wrong definition of a lob. They think that a lob is a ball that goes over someone's head. A lob is not a ball that goes over someone's head. It's just a high ball. Whether there's someone at the net is, is of no, no matter. Going cross court with a lob gives you more room. The court is longer. If you hit it a little bit short, at least you don't have this person who's going to you know, shove it down your throat. And then you can buy yourself time to get in. All right, let's see. 40 people are here and only 14 likes. Let's see if we can get it to 30 likes. I'm looking at the timer. Let's see if we can get it to 30 likes in 30 seconds. I bet we can do it. Uh, question, when the ball lands close to the baseline during rally, why do we usually see video players bend so much, almost close to ground, whereas we usually hit either on the rise or move back? So the WTA... Um, yeah, you tend to see WATA players, they're definitely being trained to do that. I have no idea. I would never, I would never tell people to, to necessarily do that. So good question. I don't know the, I don't know the answer. Uh, competitive tennis player in the Netherlands. My full game is really, oh, we got to 20 likes. That was quick. Uh, I serve about blah, blah, blah. When I upgraded, I feel my elbows have been inconsistent. Do you have any tips? Ruben, here's what I would recommend. And I truly mean this. I want to help you. And this is the kind of stuff that I kind of specialize in, okay? So if you go to twominutetennis.net and you sign up for the premium membership, you get a free, one free Zoom private lesson with me. That is where you and I meet live on Zoom. You send me video of your serve. You wanna go from 160 to 180 uh, kilometers an hour. And I put you side by side with Kyrgios and Federer and JJ Wolf and Sam Groth and anyone, right? Uh, maybe Zoom lesson. Hey, yeah, exactly. You need to meet with me. I need to look at it. We write the notes down. We meet for an hour. You see the side-by-side -side comparison. You'll see yourself right next to Felix Auger Aliassime. And we're drawing on the screen and we're looking for the differences, right? There's no difference between your body and the pro's body. Sure, they practice more and they have some incredible talent, but we can move our body the way the pros do. So we can absolutely uh, take your game to the next level. Um, let's see here. What's the price of one single loom? If that's possible, I'll check. Yeah, the Zoom one Zoom lesson is one hundred and twenty dollars, but you get one free if you sign up for forty bucks for the Zoom pri for, for the uh, the monthly membership. Cancel any time, right? Um, the, let, let's talk about this because this is an interesting topic. The topic is the elbow. 
So you see a lot of coaches talking about this position, right? This trophy position, this position where the hand, just go to, yeah, 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 Ruben, just go to twominutetennis.net. See what's best for you, okay? Hand above the elbow. This position right here, and, and you see coaches, they'll put the student, they'll have them like throw a ball. Let me get the tennis ball here. They'll have the, the student in this position and throw a ball from that position, hand above the elbow. That is not the power position on the serve. That is simply not the power position on the serve. This is the power position on the serve. This position. Elbowing someone behind you. I just made a video on this on YouTube three hours ago. And I showed Feder, I showed JJ Wolf, I showed Felix Lajalicin with different ideas on how to serve faster. But it was this position right here. And this position is the power position where you can really crush the serve. Do, do you all know what the number one power source on the serve is? What is the number one power source when it comes to the serve? Oh, we were just too short of 30. I was hoping we were going to get 30 likes. Dang it. Do we just need two to reach 30? What is the, the number one power source on the serve? It's not the feet because wheelchair tennis players can serve 120 miles an hour or uh, 100 miles an hour. It's not the legs. The legs are, I can, I can serve, I, when I was in my 20s, I could serve 97 miles an hour on my knees. When I, I went to the, the US Pro Indoor that was in Philadelphia. It's not the jump. The jump is that, see, this is bad because this isn't your fault. All of you who are saying it's the legs, it's the, it's the jump, that is not the number one power source on the serve. The number one power source in the serve is this move from elbow back to elbow in front. That is the number one power source in the serve. <laughs> to have a racket. Yeah, that is the number one power source, your racket. The number one power source is the elbow from behind you driving up. And the reason is because of the circle that the racket makes. You have to draw a circle on the serve. The, the serve is a circular movement. Please realize that. Your racket, if it could sky right, you know the like planes during an air show and they sky right in the air? If your racket could sky right, it would draw a circle as you're serving. The circle is very important because if you have a piece of paper, the circle is the shape you could draw the fastest. You can't draw a square or a triangle as fast as a circle. That's why a circular motion builds racket speed. That means what we want is to have the elbow back a far distance so that the elbow has a farther distance to travel. And we all know what the definition of speed is, distance over time. So if you have a lower toss and then your elbow is back, your elbow has a far distance to go in a very short amount of time. Now, do your legs add power to your serve? Absolutely, but in my experience, Rarely do I see people using their legs at the right time because you cannot just use your legs. Like I can't just play baseball and swing anytime I want and think I'm a great baseball player. I actually have to swing at the right time. It doesn't matter if my swing is great and I have full technique. If I'm swinging before the pitch comes or I swing after the pitch comes, like there's timing involved too. So what you want, and I'll show you this, is get a birthday hat, get a birthday hat. You're going to toss and you're gonna have your elbow back like this. So when you lift your racket, don't get your racket vertical right away. I, I just made a video on this three hours ago on YouTube, check it out. When you toss the ball, don't try to get your racket vertical. When you lift your racket, try to bring your racket up so your racket's around shoulder level and it's parallel to the ground. So you're getting into this position. Then you knock off the birthday hat. See, if Roger Federer served with a birthday hat on, he would hit the hat off of his head. Same thing with Nick Kyrgios. Same thing with uh, Osaka. Same thing with JJ Wolf. Not every pro knocks off the birthday hat. But if you're struggling with your serve, try the birthday hat serve and it's gonna help you. So you wanna make this move. This is the number one power source in the serve. It is not the legs. 
The legs can add a couple miles an hour when done right, but it is not the legs. If you use your legs and you have a really bad arm motion, your serve's not gonna be that powerful or accurate or with spin or anything. But if you have a really great arm motion and you don't use your legs, your arm, your, your serve's gonna be really good. All right, guys, we got about, mm, about 10 minutes. Let's see what questions we got here. Oh, you can't find where to put, oh, the loose arm, yeah. Aurora, that's good, cannot find, just give me a, just give me a thumbs up then, right? Just give me a thumbs up, even though I can't see it, I appreciate it. I'm having trouble with my serve. I find my first serve is in the net a lot. I end up pushing the, the ball into the box for my second serve. How can I be more consistent? Yeah, Vivin. So one of the most common reasons why players hit the net is that they face forward. So let me tilt this down here for a second. Let me tilt this down for a second. So let's say I'm serving this direction, right? So I'm serving this direction. If I face forward, it's very easy for me to bend from the waist and pull down on my serve. So here's what I would recommend. Two ideas. I want you to keep your body sideways as you serve and hit up. Now I can't because there's a ceiling right here above me because I'm indoors. But keep your body sideways. Now people talk about this as shoulder over shoulder. But the idea is don't face forward when you're serving. Stay what feels to be completely sideways and swing up, meaning try to swing up into the ball. Swing up into the ball. Don't pull down, obviously. But keep your body what feels to be perfectly to the side, and you'll, you'll feel a big difference in not hitting the net as much. Sorry, I'm moving this around here. Let's see. Any other questions? Do a forehand comparison. Yeah, absolutely, I will. Yep, absolutely, I will. Guys, real quick, um, if you want me to help you with your game, if you want me to help you with your serve, your forehand, your backhand, your net game, go to Two Minute Tennis and get a Zoom private lesson with me. This is where you and I meet live on Zoom, and we do a, I do a live analysis for you right in front of you. You're asking me questions. You're demonstrating. I just gave a lesson to a guy in Dubai. Uh, this was on Friday and he was demonstrating his forehand for me. And I'm, I, I have videos of him serving. I have videos of him hitting forehand. So we looked over his forehand and his serve in that lesson and incredible. He got a recording of the whole thing. I showed him everything that he needs to do. It's the most valuable lesson you'll ever take. See, a tennis court, it's a good place to practice, but it is not the best place to learn. Learning about your game off court, just like you're doing now. There's, there's a real benefit why we can do a live like this, right? Because you're learning, you're like, oh yeah, I can lob cross court in doubles and avoid the net player. You know, oh yeah, I can, I can work on this with my elbow, you know, on the serve. There, uh, uh, wait, are you are not wearing a two minute tennis t-shirt today? That's right. I apologize. I'm so sorry. I gotta do some laundry. When will your next live take place? Well, I normally do lives every Monday through Friday while I'm picking up my kids. Um, but today is a holiday, so kids had no school today, so I thought I'd go live. But I'm actually giving a woman a live Zoom lesson in 12 minutes, which is why I'm looking at the clock, because I got a lesson with a woman in Denver uh, on her serve. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to go in just a second here. Having trouble hitting a slice serve, I try to toss the ball at one o'clock, I'm good with a kick serve. Yeah, um, I would have, and D, I would have to see what you're doing. The fact that you know that it's one o'clock um, really is gonna be beneficial. I will say this, when you are hitting a, a slice serve, you really have to make sure that you swing, if you're right-handed, to the right of your target. So let me show you this. What you don't want is to swing towards your target on a slicer. So if I swing straight toward the wall, right, I'm gonna hit a very flat serve because the only way to swing toward the wall and to hit to the wall is to hit very flat. Well, if I wanna hit slice and I wanna get the ball to spin like this, what I wanna do is I wanna swing, you can see the stairs, you can see like right there, the stairs going up to the kitchen. So what I actually wanna do is I wanna to swing to the stairs and then the ball goes that way. 
see what, see what happened there? I'm, I'm swinging that way, and the ball goes that way. The way to make that happen is to do this, right? It's like I'm, my strings are facing where I want the ball to go, but my racket is traveling the direction I want the ball to spin. You don't, just make sure that you're not swinging towards your target. If you swing towards your target, you're gonna have no spin whatsoever because you're gonna have to point your strings to your target. And when your strings face the same direction as your racket travels, you're gonna get no spin. You wanna point your strings in one direction and swing to the, to the right. Obviously you're, you're talking about one o'clock, so you're obviously right-handed. You've gotta swing to basically the net post. All right, guys, I've got time for one last question. Let's see here. You got to having trouble with my returns. Uh, every time I get a fast serve, I always have to hit it with a lot of loop and it flies out. Hmm. Every time I get a really fast serve, and it was interesting you said, um, I, oh, I always hit it with a lot of loop uh, and it flies out. All right, try something here on the return. This is going to be a great tip for all of you on the return of serve. And see, it's so funny. People go, Ryan, how can I learn on Zoom taking a tennis lesson? Yet they'll do lives and I'll give them answers to their questions, and they go, wow, that really helped. It's the exact same thing, except I can see how you're hitting on Zoom because you send me videos prior. You send me videos, and I do an analysis because I share my screen. You get to see your forehand versus Carlos Alcaraz, your backhand versus Djokovic, whatever it is, your overhead against fetters, whatever, and I do a side-by-side -side comparison record the whole thing. There's so much value to a Zoom lesson. Go to twominutetennis.net, and I'll help you on Zoom. Uh, let's talk about the return of serve. Here's one of the best tips you can get on a return of serve. The idea is to stick your elbows out. So watch this. When I'm returning serve, look at my elbows. In fact, you can see the space under my armpits and you can see the wall behind me. Don't be like this. Be like this. When your elbows are out away from your body, when you turn, it helps you have a very small swing. When your elbows are in, anytime your elbow comes in, and it's a little hard because I have a black sweatshirt on, but anytime your elbow is in, your racket goes farther back. Watch, I push my elbow out, and now my racket's not as far back. The angle in my wrist is staying the same. There's no difference in the elbow in my, uh, the angle of my wrist. So when you're returning really fast serves, first off, stand farther back than you normally do. Stand much farther back than you norm normally do, so you have more time. The second thing is, you wanna keep your elbows out, whether it's on the backhand, Keep this elbow up, that shortens the backswing. It also helps close the racket face. If your elbows are in, then your racket face is gonna be open. Push the elbow out, it shortens the swing and it helps close the racket and then that ball is not gonna go out. So keep your elbows out in the ready position and you will see a big improvement in your return to serve. Everyone, thank you so much. I normally go live for about an hour, but in just a few short minutes, I'm giving a Zoom lesson to a woman uh, halfway across the country on her serve. Uh, so I will be stopping now. Look, if you want me to help you with your tennis game personally, not just you typing on the screen, but personally, you want me to help you with your tennis game. You got basically two options. You can go to twominutetennis.net and sign up for a la carte lessons with me where you send me videos. Yeah, you got it, Cindy. You send me videos of your serve, your backhand. I do match strategy. Tomorrow, I'm doing a singles strategy match analysis for one of my students who's actually only three hours away from me. Um, but we're gonna meet live on Zoom. He already sent me the match on Swing Vision. I've already got the points that I've already recorded and taken and I've wrote, written the notes down. And we're gonna go point by point. I've got about 20 points to show him where he can improve his footwork and his core positioning and his shot selection and just his overall tactics and strategies. So you can purchase a Zoom private lesson with me a la carte. It's $120 per lesson. You can also become a premium member. Here's the second option. You can also become a premium member of twominutetennis.net. It's $40 a month, cancel anytime. You get a weekly live class with me every Wednesday on Zoom with just the other members. And it's not like this where I can't see you because I can see you. I, can, I have people demonstrating in their houses and they're like, Ryan, can you help me You know, stay palm down on my serve? Look what I'm doing. And I'm like, oh, Gary, look at your grip, da, 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 da. So those classes are awesome. They're an hour long on Wednesday nights, 9 p.m. New York City time. Uh, you also, when you sign up, the moment you sign up, you get credit for one of those um, those $120 Zoom lessons. You get one free. Um, so a lot of people are like, wait, I can pay $120 and just get one, or I can pay $40 and get a Zoom lesson plus the other classes. And then you also get 
uh, 50% off any stroke analysis or Zoom lesson that you purchase in the future. Um, so that cuts that 160 in, in half already. So go to twominutetennis.net, become a premium member if you think that's something uh, that is best for you. But heck, I, I keep talking. I got to go. I got a class to teach. I'll talk to you all really uh, uh, for the premium. Is it one lesson per month? No, it is not. Otherwise, I, I have two. No, it's you got one free one. <laughs> it is not one. It is not. Yeah, I, I would I would never eat, sleep or see my kids. It would I would be working 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, so it is just one. Correct. Yes. So thank you all so much. Yeah, you got it. Holy smokes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Aren't enough hours in the day. So thank you so much. You got it, AJ. Thank you so much. I'll talk to you all really soon. And 